So first, let me introduce uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who is a member of Greece's parliament and parliamentary leader of Mira 25, which was established in March 2018 as the Greek political party belonging to Democracy in Europe movement, BM25, Europe's first transnational pan-European movement, which he co-founded in February 2016. Uh, led by Varoufakis, Mira 25 entered parliament with nine uh, members in the July 2019 election, general election. Previously, he served as Greece's finance minister during the first six months of 2015. Varoufakis has academic degrees in mathematics and economics from the universities of Essex and Birmingham, and subsequently taught economics at six universities, including the University of Athens, where he still holds chair in political economy and economic theory. He also has honorary degrees at four universities. He's the author of a number of best-selling books, including Another Now, Dispatches from an Alternative Present, which we saw some material from in an article of The Guardian. Um, he also uh, published Adults in the Room, My Struggle Against Europe's Deep Establishment, plus seven others. In his own words, Varoufakis was, quote, thrust onto the public scene by Europe's inane handling of an inevitable crisis, unquote. And he'll, he'll say more about that perhaps today. Our other guest this morning is uh, Ms. Lisa Graves, who created True North Research and is its executive director and editor in chief. She has spearheaded several major breakthrough investigations into many organizations and entities responsible for distorting American democracy and public policy. True North has several research projects, including uh, cokedocs.org. I usually like to pronounce their name uh, in honor of their uh, Dutch heritage as the Koch brothers, but I'll try to refrain <laughs> from that today. Uh, and IWF Exposed, which is another uh, faux uh, grassroots organization, the Independent Women's Forum. Um, which shine a light on these issues. She served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the US Department of Justice in the Clinton administration, Chief Counsel for nominations for Senator Patrick Leahy on the US Senate Judiciary Committee, Deputy Chief of the Article III Judges Division of the Administrative Office of US Courts, and as Adjunct Law Professor at George uh, Washington University Law School. In 2018, she helped shape the national conversation on the Brett Kavanaugh nomination, although I don't think we can hold her personally responsible for the confirmation. One of the nation's foremost experts on how special interests distort our political system, Lisa has been a frequent guest on virtually all major television net news channels and numerous radio broadcasts. Her op-eds and articles and analyses have been cited and published in dozens of high-profile high news and current affair outlets, as well as in several recent highly acclaimed books. She was featured in Lisa, in uh, Ava DuVernay's documentary, The 13th, which was nominated for an Oscar in 2017 and has appeared in several other uh, film productions. Uh, from 2009 to 2017, she led the Center for Media and Democracy and is the president of its board of directors. She earned a JD cum laude from Cornell Law School and a BS with highest honors in political science from the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. So with that, let me turn this over uh, to Yanis Varoufakis for his remarks and looking forward to hearing both of you. Well, now, thank you so much for the invitation, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Noam. It's been a while since I've seen you. Hope to see you very soon. I promise to make the trip over to Arizona. Lisa, it's great to be sharing this forum with you, but uh, allow me to go straight into the topic. Um, I've taken this task literally uh, as one of um, uh, relating to you some thoughts regarding the consequences of capitalism. And let me give you a preview of what I'm going to be doing over the next 19 minutes or so. Uh, firstly, I'm going to uh, begin with um, um, you know, uh, recounting the standard argument, beginning with Adam Smith onwards, in favor of um, 
uh, a market society, a society not only that features markets, but that relies entirely on markets for all productive activities and redistributive activities. So competitive markets will be the introduction. Uh, the second segment will be about why I think, well, it will be the argument, not just my argument, but a very prominent argument, that capitalism became successful only when it killed off competition and moved on uh, from its competitive phase in the 19th century to its oligopoly phase, um, uh, the mega firm foundations of capitalism beginning with the second industrial revolution. Uh, the third segment will be devoted to uh, the effects of commodification. Since we're talking about the consequences of capitalism, I want to talk about commodification, which runs throughout, you know, actually uh, paves the ground for capitalism and then was turbocharged by capitalism, what that means for society. Um, the fourth section will be on the events of 2008, because it, you know, I'm a strong believer that 2008 was our generation's 1929. And um, the world changed in the same way that the world changed in 1929 and you had the Grapes of Wrath and the Second World War and so on. And Burton Woods, uh, I believe that 2008 is an equivalent milestone, uh, turning point, call it what you may. Uh, and then finally, I shall conclude with some thoughts about, about what all this means regarding the con consequences of what goes by the name of capitalism. So. Uh, enough of the, of the table of contents. Let's go straight into the, the first section, which is on competitive markets and the claims made for it. Uh, the beauty of the Adam Smith argument, um, which was very surprising and very radical at the time, was that here's a moral philosopher who um, doesn't want people to be moral for society to be moral. Indeed, it's quite the opposite. It is the greed of the butcher the baker and the brewer. The fact that they don't care about society, that helps them, without this being their intention, to bring about prosperity and freedom. The idea is that it's all based on unintended consequences. Each one of them seeks profit maximization or maximizes profit. Uh, but because they live, w work in a marketplace where there is competition between them, between different producers, b different bakers, different butchers, different ale producers, uh, each one of them is motivated only by the self-interest. Uh, so what do they do? They try to undercut each other, like mafiosi in New York who wipe themselves out, <laughs> therefore serving the public interest. Similarly, capitalism is good because capitalists are bad. Capitalists try to undermine each other, but they do this by pushing prices down, increasing quantities, improving qualities. Therefore, they serve the, they serve the public interest, the public good, precisely because they're not intending to serve it. That's a, you know, it's, it's a fascinating argument. You can imagine the students of Adam Smith thought, My, oh, wow, whether they agreed or disagreed. Um, that was you know, a very powerful argument. So, But the, 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 pic, the depiction of capitalism, which is still dominant, it's still, still the dominant paradigm, even though it has absolutely no connection to the truth, to this day, is of capitalism as a market system. M markets that are competitive, and uh, imagine them as an archipelago of Robinson Crusoe's. Imagine you know, millions of little islands, each one of them inhabited by a Robinson Crusoe. And imagine there is a network of, um, um, you know, a trade network between them. Uh, so each one of them sends to another one stuff in a boat and they exchange, uh, the truck, barter, and exchange in the language of Adam Smith. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful story, uh, which, you know, in the context of the, this particular model of the world, it sounds as if uh, the perfect way of balancing selfishness, the public good, the public interest, with liberty, each Robinson Crusoe does whatever each Robinson Crusoe wants to do. Uh, and in the end, it's voluntary exchanges without anyone telling anyone what to do. So liberty, prosperity, selfishness, and the public good all combined in one, as if by an invisible hand, which of course implies the hand of God and so on. So, you know, um, theology comes in through the back door, even for atheists like Adam Smith. 
Um, okay, so that's the, the, the you know the, the original uh, story. The fact, however, is that none of us would have heard of capitalism, and capitalism would not have survived if um, we if 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 market society, if capitalism had not transcended that phase. And the way it transcended that phase and became successful was uh, with the invention of uh, electromagnetism, you know, the scientific applications of Maxwell's electromagnetic equations, uh, which made possible th the networked firm, you know, the, the Edison, uh, you know, the, the Ford Motor Company, all those, you know, the telegraph, the telephone, all these networked companies, which relied on the second industrial revolution to create gigantic economies of scale and to create a company like Edison, which does everything from the building in which the power station is somewhere in New York, right? To the cables that go to every house, to every office, to the last lamp that it lights up, that electricity lights up, one company. Now, that company can never be competitive, can never operate in a competitive environment. I mean, there cannot be, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 such companies, all of them connected to your home. And you choose, you know, from moment, moment to moment, which electricity supply you want to choose from. So by definition, this is a monopoly. So what made capitalism successful was the demise of competition. For a company like Edison to be put together or Apple these days, right? net worth companies. Uh, you needed huge quantities of money, finance, credit. Edison simply didn't have the money to do it. And the banks that existed prior to this monopoly phase of capitalism were too small uh, to be able to provide this mega finance. So what you have is consolidation amongst bankers. And you've got the mega firm, the Edisons and the Fords, making it necessary for the mega bank to be created. Mega banks had the capacity effectively to print their own money out of thin air. It was dollars, but most of it was credit and the money that circulated in the capitalist economy at the turn of the century, 19th to 20th century and beyond, the 1910s and the 1920s, was all fictitious capital. But it was so large, it financed huge power of the mega banks and the mega firms, and of course, it created gigantic rates of growth in the 1920s. The roaring 20s are the result of this, as is, of course, the mega crisis of 1929. Because if you give the bankers, the mega bankers, the opportunity effectively to print mountain ranges of money out of thin air, and they make money out of it, there is no stopping them. So in the end, you know, the quantity, the volume of money they produce is greater than planet Earth at some point those houses of cards stop, start, start tumbling down and you have a systemic crisis like 1929. Um, okay, so that's the second section of what I wanted to cover today under the title Consequences of Capitalism. Now, I want to go a bit back in history with commodification because what created the circumstances that led somebody like Adam Smith to feel the need to write a text like um, The Wealth of Nations, and before that, The Theory of the Moral Sentiments, was the process of commodification, which began with the establishment of um, uh, network comp uh, oh, sorry, networks of international trade, elevated some goods into the position of um, into the role of um, uh, international commodities, whose prices were determined in, at the international level, not in the local marketplace. Uh, and that you know, changed the world because when the price of wool became an international price, not a price that was set in Devon or in Cornwall or in Wales or in Scotland, but it was set internationally, and that price was high, suddenly you had a commodification of labor because lords and barons realized that it was much more profitable for them to get rid of the peasants and replace them with sheep. And that created the first influx of landless peasants now 
to the towns. You had the creation of um, a proletariat in, the, in, in, in waiting, and you had land that was cleared of the peasants, and suddenly its value could be associated with the value of the wool whose price was internationally set. So you have the commodification of land, commodification of labor, because the landless peasants had to knock on doors and say, I will do anything for a loaf of bread. So suddenly you had a labor market for the first time in human history. Uh, and then, you know, when James Watt th threw in the steam engine into this bowl and mixed very um, powerfully and energetically, you had the factory. Um, and and, and it, so this process of commodification is a triumphant march of exchange value over use value, over experiential value. You know, even some of us who are not in our 20s and 30s, we still remember our grandmothers and grandfathers doing things themselves. I remember my grandmother making clothes and baking bread in the house. So, that, you know, that had huge value to us, but it had no market value, no exchange value. So commodification is the process of the conversion of experiential values, use values into um, exchange values. And capitalism was born out of this process of commodification and turbocharged it. But with the transition from the baker, the butcher and the brewer to the Edison, the Henry Ford, the you know, Apple and the Google and Amazons of the world, uh, what we have is a commodification process, which is ruled not in the context of a republic of breakers, butchers, and brewers, but, also, but in a kind of techno-feudalism. You've got six, five, three, 20 companies at most, without any competitors, controlling the process of utter and boisterous commodification. Now, the problem with this is that um, uh, the greater the commodification produced by and overseen by uh, this techno-feudalism, uh, the greater the incongruity between what those factories and production lines can produce and that which society can consume. Because the market power of the techno-feudal lords translates into a shifting distribution of income from the many to the few, the many have less and less money to be able to purchase the abundance that the production lines of the few can produce. And you have a constant, you know, what Larry Summers, not one of my favorite persons, uh, refers to as secular stagnation. It was the exuberance of a very strange recycling system that start, happened after 1971 which allowed Wall Street primarily, but also the city of London and some French and German banks to uh, create inordinate quantities of money, of private money, which operated like the fuel that drove globalization together with the entry into the labor market of some like you know, 2 billion workers following the collapse of the Soviet Union satellites, the entry of China and India into the international division of, cap of labor of capitalist labor markets, that process created the semblance of um, the great moderation, if you remember the term, the semblance that, you know, th this time things are different uh, and, and that you can have permanent growth with low inflation and under the guise of financialization and globalization. That was nothing more than another version of the roaring 20s and our 1929 hit us in the year 2008. And that's when, from my perspective, um, the present moment in history was made. And it's a very sad and very difficult point in history. It has lasted already 12 years. COVID-19 has visited us during that period um, and has done nothing new except then take the whole process that began in 2008 and has made it harsher, more toxic, more um, dangerous. Uh, now, what happened in 2008 was this. Wall Street was effectively recycling the profits of non-American capitalists. German capitalists, Dutch capitalists, Italian capitalists, you know, Japanese and, of course, Chinese later on capitalists were producing 
large quantities of profits on the back of the American trade deficit. The American trade deficit was sucking into American territory the net exports of these countries. Now, who was paying for this constantly expanding American trade deficit? Well, the capitalists of the rest of the world who were making their money because of this American trade deficit were sending their money to Wall Street for higher returns through financialization and through the suppression of the wages of American workers, which were creating possibilities for Japanese money, Chinese money to make more money through financialization and greater competitiveness in the United States established on the back of the diminution of the American working class. Um, now, these, this financialization process, which was mediating between the, the profits of the rest of the world and um, the American trade deficit, this process created huge houses of cards. They collapsed in 2008. Okay, Obama comes in, together with the rest of the G20 in April 2009. They coordinate the printing presses of the central banks. They print huge quantities of money. They give it to the bankers. They refloat them. The American trade deficit goes back within a year. But what never came back after 2008 was the capacity of Wall Street to take the profits of financialized capital and plow it into the economy of the United States and the rest of the world in the form of productive investment. That's why since 2008, we have the most amount of money that humanity ever had, the highest savings in the history of humanity, and by comparison, the lowest level of investment in the history of humanity. This disconnect, um, excess of savings over investment is the reason why we had deflationary forces. Deflation always poisons democracies, creates Trumps and Bolsonaros. And so like in the 1930s, you had excess savings that created uh, the fascists in Europe. Uh, and, and we have been stuck in this stag stagnating financialized techno-feudalism. I don't even call it capitalism anymore. Uh, for reasons that I've already sort of alluded to, not fully explained, uh, but alluded to. Um, and now for the conclusion. You know, uh, one of the great gurus of libertarianism, of neoliberalism, Friedrich von Hayek, said once something that was very apt about us lefties. I'm talking about myself now, about socialists. He said, the problem with socialists, they are not bad people. They are not immoral people. They are quite ethical people. The problem with socialists is that in order to introduce socialism, they have to violate basic socialist principles. Now, judging by the Soviet Union, he, he was right. <laughs> I hope that he's not universally right. But uh, if we look at the experience of socialism in action so far, he was right. And this is a self-critical uh, viewpoint by a socialist. Uh, but the problem, however, is now that that applies with even greater force to the neoliberals. To impose neoliberalism, they have to violate basic concepts and basic values of liberalism. They were never liberal. They invoke uh, neoliberalism the same way that the Soviet masters invoked Marxism. Marxism has nothing to do, had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. It was just an excuse. Similarly now. So the the point I want to leave you with, and then we can take it up in the conversation, is that uh, we are already in a post-capitalist moment. The consequences of capitalism in the final analysis is that capitalism has undermined itself. It's already morphed into a kind of feudalism with hugely important and wonderful technologies, utterly reliant on the state. This is why it's feudal, because there are few barons totally reliant on the state. Markets have gone. There are no markets. Amazon is not a market. Amazon owns, it's like, you know, Amazon is the equivalent of uh, Main Street, where one person owns not only every shop and every good that is being peddled, but, the, the, you know, the tarmac, the park benches, the air people breathe, the whole city. That's not capitalism. That's not a market society. That's feudalism. It's techno-feudalism. And this techno-feudalism is simply incapable of doing any, anything more than po poisoning our politics, our democracies, uh, allowing climate change to go rampant, and creating circumstances for war. Um, and that's where I'm going to rest my case and my little 21-minute soliloquy 
on what I consider the consequences of capitalism to be. Thanks very much for that. And I'm going to turn it right now to uh, Lisa Graves for her remarks, and then we'll come back for hopefully quite a lively conversation. Well, uh, it was wonderful to hear your thoughts, Yannick, and um, I was just mesmerized by your description. I wanted to um, take a somewhat different approach in terms of sharing some of the work that I've been doing and uh, the work that's very US, you know, US based, uh, but I think uh, certainly in harmony with many of the insights uh, that our opening speaker has brought forth. Um, but I wanted to begin uh, with, rather than diving into that, I just wanted to express my deep appreciation for Noam and Marvin. Um, these st you students uh, are so fortunate to have such great teachers, such great human beings who uh, have devoted their lives to trying to make our world a better place. And um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the, I don't know if it's a tragedy of youth is uh, not really appreciating these moments, uh, this time to have this class and the, and the people that uh, they brought forward to teach you um, about our world and our country. And so I just wanted to say, um, I'm just deeply grateful um, to both of you uh, for all you've done in your life's work. And, just for the privilege it is to come and, and speak uh, to your class. So uh, I'll, I'll jump in, but I had to say it from my heart. So um, <clears throat> what I wanna focus on today is a bit about the reading that you've done on the Powell Memo um, and talk a bit about how that, how that has been implemented in the US and uh, its implications and then conclude with some hopeful thoughts, I hope. So, um, uh, let me just begin. Uh, you may be wondering, why are you reading about a, a memo that was written 50 years ago this year? Why would someone reply to a memo that was written 50 years ago this year, the Powell Memo? And it's because it's had such a devastating effect on American democracy. Um, it has been uh, 50 years of, of being implemented and refined and expanded. And some of that distortion has certainly affected other countries through some of the vehicles that have been created in response to that memo. That memo uh, does not you know, sit alone. It wasn't just a solo act. It builds upon um, several decades before of opposition to democratic principles, to democratic processes, to social programs that really uh, invigorate um, and invest in people and people's lives. But it came at a moment um, where um, there was uh, a gathering, I suppose, of forces willing to take on that memo. So let me just talk a bit about um, the kind of four things that it, it attempted to do and then how that's been brought forward. Um, it was a, a reaction in some ways to the immediate prior, prior decade, um, you know, not just the 60s in sort of a cultural sense, but the fact that we had a civil rights movement that we had a civil rights act that finally in America um, brought forward, <clears throat> at least attempted to bring forward the promises of the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment um, to, Amer to, the, to the American people to redress the structural racism that was uh, sort of the original sin of our country. Um, it was in reaction, that memo was in reaction to the fact that there was a Voting Rights Act that was now bringing more people into our democracy, able to vote without poll taxes and literacy tests and other repression. It was a reaction to the tremendous work of Ralph Nader uh, to hold corporations accountable for products that were dangerous, deadly um, products that uh, corporations were putting their profits directly ahead of the fact that they knew these products would cause uh, serious injury and death. It came a reaction to Earth Day, which was, which was created in 1970 uh, uh, launched in 1970 after one of the most massive oil spills off the coast of the United States, off the coast of Santa Barbara, and people coming together and saying, we have to protect our Earth, this planet, this precious uh, uh, planet that we live on. Um, it came as uh, Congress, uh, which was uh, controlled by Democrats, but, you know, Democrats have a variety of uh, perspectives, but uh, Congress that was willing to finally redress the fact that our, our rivers were so grotesquely polluted and on fire, that our air was so polluted from this, in, from this industrial uh, activity that was un, un, basically untrammeled, uncontained, un, largely unregulated. Um, and it was um, those efforts, along with a specific effort to regulate tobacco smoking, uh, to have there be a mere warning 
that smoking tobacco could cause cancer, that this memo sort of grew out of this as a, as a notion. The notion that memo, as you read, was supposedly, I'm gonna paraphrase here, that no one in America had less influence on public policy than American businessmen. It was laughable at the time for that assertion to be made. It, it's, it's so absurd in hindsight, but the premise of that memo was that uh, poor business in America was being subject to regulation and how dare there be this regulation and they needed to mount a massive campaign to defend and advance their vision of capitalism, their view of capitalism as basically a lack of regulation. Um, and they needed to invest in uh, the, the instruments of power in modern America in order to dominate it because they were upset that they were being regulated for their pollution, for their cancer causing products, for their, um, you know, in some ways the war machine uh, that was manifesting in different ways in the United States. And, um, and, they, and this memo came forward. Well, who was Lewis Powell? Lewis Powell was um, at the time just a lawyer, just a lawyer in, uh, in Virginia, but he was also the tobacco lawyer. He was the man who helped orchestrate the tobacco industry's campaign of utter deception to the American people to resist a mere warning on tobacco cigarettes that they were carcinogenic. But that's not all Lewis Powell was. Lewis Powell was previously the uh, main lawyer for the city of Richmond as it, as it resisted the implementation of Brown versus Board of Education. And as it protected the racially segregated schools of Richmond, Virginia, the heart, the capital of the Confederacy uh, in the United States. Um, that's who Lewis Powell was. But shortly after that memo, he became some, something else. He became a Supreme Court justice chosen by Richard Nixon to live, to, to sit on that court for the rest of his life. And what he did from that seat was really to pervert our, our American constitution to advance this corporate agenda, to embed it into the law in ways that it had not previously been. Now I say that there, there certainly had been an embedding of corporate ideology, corporate power, going back to the Santa Clara Railroad case uh, at least a um, hundred years before. But what Lewis Powell did was engraft on the constitution these ideas that would really uh, bring forward some of the ruin we've seen. And one of those efforts was to advance the idea that we, the people could not adequately regulate, could not really have the power under our constitution to regulate uh, certain types of uh, campaign activity around elections. And that's the Buckley versus Vallejo decision that many of you may have heard of that is the foundation for the Citizens United decision, the discredited decision um, that the Supreme Court issued in 2010, which has unleashed this massive amount of dark money into our elections. Um, but Powell, uh, that Powell memo was, uh, it was commissioned by the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, which you know, has a bunch of little chambers of commerce in the states and has uh, worked against people's interests, ordinary people's interests for you know, basic things like increase the minimum wage, paid sick leave, uh, family medical leave, um, all sorts of programs that really are helpful for the American people, the chamber has opposed. But the chamber, until its recent PR campaign, has also been one of the main instruments of trying to block efforts to redress climate change and so much more. It's also been one of the main vehicles for um, attacking uh, the power of people to hold corporations accountable through uh, tort law, through uh, civil law in the United States when someone's injured. But this Powell memo, um, it wasn't just a one-off memo that just happened in 1971. It was a memo that some very powerful people sought to implement right away. Um, uh, the Coors fortune was immediately put into work uh, to create the Heritage Foundation. Heritage Foundation didn't exist before the Powell memo. It was launched by Paul Weyrich, a man who um, was a far right sort of extremist, someone who uh, was uh, at the beginning of the sort of libertarian movement in the United States uh, and someone who um, sought to advance uh, a, a sort of super religious view of American democracy. Uh, and he was caught on tape basically about a decade later saying uh, he doesn't want more people to vote. When more people vote, his people lose. And his people were described as these white evangelical right-wingers basically. Um, Paul Weyrich uh, got a very wealthy man to stake him in the Heritage Foundation. Another group that was created right after that was ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. It's a group that I've written a bit about, quite a bit about. I launched alecexposed.org about 10 years ago. Um, that's a group where uh, American legislators, including many of your legislators, uh, if they're Republicans, um, vote 
as equals with corporate lobbyists on measures, basically model bills to change our rights in the states. And let me just repeat that because it's so astonishing to me that there exists an organization in the United States that describes itself as the largest voluntary group of state legislators in the country. And what it actually is, is a corporate funded group that happens to bring legislators together with corporate lobbyists and behind closed doors without you or the press present, what they do is vote on bills to make life harder for you and easier for them. And then those bills are introduced in the state houses across the country and pushed into law very often without any real uh, meaningful hearings from the people and with very little opportunity to amend them. You may have heard of some of those laws. They include um, laws to make it harder for Americans to vote through voter ID restrictions. They include prison privatization bills, numerous bills to make a profit off of incarcerating people, numerous bills that, that, uh, ex that were around for uh, you know, a couple decades, basically making prison sentences longer, increasing the profits of those prison companies that were the members and funders of ALEC. It includes a, a whole array of anti-environmental measures. Uh, it includes basically the wish list of the oil companies of the world uh, in the US, including uh, that there should be no taxes on windfall profits. Why not? There should be no capital gains taxes. There should be no inheritance taxes. There should be no corporate taxes, um, on and on and on. And that is uh, an agenda that's been driven by these corporations that were brought together as part of an entity that was created in response to the Powell memo. Um, there are uh, numerous ways in which the universities have been distorted by that memo. There was an effort to have corporations invest more deeply, deeply invest, let me use those words purposefully, in universities in order to distort what people were being taught, distort who becomes a professor, who gets tenure, what the subject is that people get to see and learn about at universities. And Uncook My Campus uh, has done tremendous work to help expose that in Arizona and across the country. Um, but that's not all. Uh, they also invested, wanted to invest in the courts, to capture the courts, to change the law, to invest in these um, strategic litigation groups to basically distort American law. And they've been very successful in doing so. And also another goal of the Palm Moment was to push this PR about um, the, cap, the form of capitalism that the Chamber of Commerce was interested in pushing, which was this deeply anti-regulatory agenda. You, you may have heard of this agenda in some groups that you might encounter online that are Koch funded groups like the American Legislative Exchange Council. Almost all of them have this catchphrase in their name, limited government. That's a really fancy way of saying limited democracy. It's about denying you we, the people, the power to use our elected representatives to regulate those corporations, to limit their, power, their ability to injure us, to ensure that they pay fair and appropriate and significant taxes on their massive profits so that they are not able to you know, use those profits for um, other, uh, 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 at least use them in the way that they've been allowed to use them uh, through the Citizens United decision, through the CEOs being so vastly enriched, they have so much money to influence our democracy, to distort our democracy. Um, so those were the four kind of components of that primary components that Palma Mo and the thesis behind it and its origin. But it didn't just sit there. Um, and it wasn't just implemented by a few people. It was in fact taken up by one of the now richest men in the world, Charles Koch. Charles Koch is an industrialist who uh, runs Koch Industries. It's a massive privately held corporation and um, it is heavily involved in oil refinery, but also in oil futures and all sorts of investments uh, and other pollution causing uh, activities. Uh, but Koch has actually spent really the last 50 years uh, implementing that memo. He's the longest, deepest, most enduring sort of advocate of that memo and beyond that memo in terms of trying to distort American democracy through capturing the US Supreme Court, uh, which he's you know, spoken about in recent years, his role in uh, funding efforts to basically capture that court for what he calls the rule of law, which is sort of the opposite of it. It's a reactionary agenda. He's talked about how he staked uh, and worked with a man named Leonard Leo, who the Washington Post wrote about a, about a year, two years ago now, uh, who has assembled this massive dark money network to capture the U.S. Supreme Court? Uh, he was actually he was actually caught on tape speaking to funders. This is Leonard Leo I'm talking about, telling them that due to these Supreme Court appointments, America stands at the precipice of what he described as the revival 
of what he called the structural constitution to the pre-New the pre -new Deal era, meaning the robber baron era in the United States, in which a Supreme Court would um, use its, uh, its power to strike down our power to have many of the programs that have been in existence for the last hundred years, possibly Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the power of the federal government to regulate climate, um, the power of, of, of uh, labor unions to um, the, the limited power they have now, but the remaining power to take that away. And so you, we, we are at a point in American democracy where this Powell memo, uh, as pushed in part by Koch, but not only by Koch, has had a really devastating effect on American democracy. Um, let's see, I've got a, about six minutes left. So uh, let me, let me, let me uh, talk about a couple components of this and then the hopeful, the hopeful message. Um, I was, I was, uh, I was, I noted that Giannis uh, talked about um, Adam Smith, uh, and I am also deeply critical of his, of many of his claims, including this invisible hand notion, this absurd invention uh, of faith. But um, also, um, interestingly enough, um, Adam Smith uh, in The Wealth of Nas Nations um, said, for what it's worth, that uh, the policies of um, business men, the people in the market, um, he said, quote, ought always to be listened to with great precaution. It comes from an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public, who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public, and who accordingly have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it. Those are the words of Adam Smith, you know, um, and they're accurate, although they are an understatement, quite frankly, of what we've, uh, what we've seen. Um, and what we've seen is this uh, tr tremendous domination of both parties, sort of a corporate party in many respects um, in the United States and the um, exporting of those uh, policies uh, sort of around, around the world in various ways, including through some of these think tanks that Koch has staked uh, and Alex efforts abroad to take advantage of um, the changes in Eastern Europe to try to push forward this very um, rigid agenda of um, advancing corporate interests above all else. Nancy McLean uh, wrote a tremendously important book a few years ago called Democracy in Chains about the effort to use these policies to, to chain democracy abroad that were funded by Koch in South America to constrain those constitutions, to limit the ability of the people in those countries to um, advance their democratic agendas. Um, and obviously there was also Jane Mayer's tremendous book about, um, about the, Koch, uh, the Koch network called Dark Money um, and a book just last two years ago by Chris Leonard uh, about the Koch, Koch land in essence, about its um, massive accumulation of wealth. All of those books are worthwhile reading in addition to the tremendous work by Marvin and Noam uh, and the works that are coming this year. Um, but what I, what I would say to you is that um, I, think, I think that when we look back at this period in history, whoever is around to look back at this period in history, I actually think we've entered um, sort of a post-state world. Uh, we have these corporations and these CEOs uh, that are so powerful and many of them have so much more wealth than, than individual states, individual countries. And um, as Giannis pointed out, this sort of techno-feudalism that has taken hold um, is so anti-democratic, so counter-democratic. Um, and the state, the state so far has proven incapable of constraining it, of limiting it, of, of, of really truly regulating it. And instead you have these philosophies like Charles Koch's philosophies where um, liberty is touted, although it's really property, it's really money. And it's really a, an effort to limit anything that would constrain the use of that money for almost any purpose uh, that they uh, resist through the members in Congress that they put forward. and. Uh, who they are attempting to indoctrinate through the courts, uh, judges on the courts and influence our judicial decisions. But in fact, what you have is a situation in which um, uh, we live in the United States in a country which we believe to be a, majori a majority democracy. And in fact, it is uh, a, minority, uh, a minority controlled democracy. And as one of my dear friends put it recently, um, he, he said that, um, the American people have consistently voted for center left or left uh, politics and policies and have gotten center right to right wing government. Uh, and the entire, the entirety of the non-racist part of, of Trump's argument in 2016 was 
they keep promising you stuff, but you never, they never deliver. Why not take a chance on me? That was the non-racist component of it. And what you have is minority rule in Congress in the United States Senate, but also in the way these institutions operate. You could see it in the impeachment uh, vote this week, how you can have a majority for something, but not have a sufficient majority to prevail. That's also the case with the filibuster in the United States Senate. You can have a majority for something, but not a sufficient majority to prevail. And those, um, that tension between what people want and what people need and the failure to deliver it because of this corporate dominance, this domination by these CEOs, and also this race, this racial, this structurally racist component of it has, has really uh, left us in a situation in which America has a population that desires more progressive policies, that desires action on climate change, that desires a more a just, more equitable democracy, that desires a, a greater minimum wage, better benefits, but that is thwarted time and time again by these forces. So let me just conclude on, I suppose, the hopeful note that I'm into, and I am at the, my one minute mark, which is, um, I hope that I hope that among the many things you learn from this class and this course overall is that these are choices. There's no the economy. It doesn't, it's not a, it's not a feature of nature. It's not a natural thing. It is a product of choices. It's a product of choices by people in power and people who uh, have obtained more power through this massive, utterly inequitable distribution of wealth, the lack of adequate taxation and restraint and uh, controls that would protect the interests of most uh, people in the world, great, provide greater protection. Um, and it's also the case that it's the product of strategic patience. It's the product of people being devoted to moving that agenda forward year after year, uh, whereas often you'll see on the left or progressives like, you didn't get this result, then people are frustrated, go home, go away, don't, you know, and give up. We cannot give up. We have a planet to save. We have democracies to reach their fuller, greater potential. And um, as Stacey Abrams wrote in the New York Times this past week about her effort, her 10 year effort in Georgia to get more people registered to vote in order to win elections, she said, it may take 10 years, do it anyway, do it anyway. Um, this memo that we began with, the Powell memo was written 50 years ago. And people took that memo up as their own mission. Now, Charles Koch spent only a fraction of his wealth on it, but still a substantial amount. But it's because selling a lie is so expensive, although very much easier in this digital age. But together, ordinary people can counter this if we only have the vision and the devotion and the patience to know that we can make different choices and to insist on them. So that's my opening uh, remarks. Thank you so much. Well, thanks very much to both of you. Those were really stimulating and interesting uh, uh, talks and remarks. We have a number of questions. Let me begin um, just with some smaller issues and then I think we'll build up because I think uh, the remarks were operating at uh, very different scales from each other, but I think there are ways in which we can bridge those uh, through some uh, questions that have come in. But uh, first to you, Giannis, a couple of questions have come in that asked if you could describe a little bit in a little bit more detail, um, the connections between what you see as techno feudalism um, and the propensity and, uh, and dispensations toward war, uh, particularly. Um, people wanted some clarification on how the current sort of formulations of where capitalism stands uh, lead uh, to more militarism and more war. Uh, that's a relatively easy one to answer, because from it's not it's not just a recent phenomenon, but from the moment you have uh, huge economies of scale and monopoly power, you know, even mainstream right wing economies, um, economists, you know, highlight the way in which monopolies earn profits by restricting output. Yeah, they, they have, by having excess capacity, climbing up on the demand curve for those who have suffered any economics. Uh, this is how you maximize your profits if you have market power, by having a large productive capacity, which you don't use, which you only partly use. So in a sense, um, the profits of the oligarchs are maximized when there is unemployed labor, Labor's demand is constrained by 
the restrictions in output, which means as labor demand is constrained, wages are constrained. So s many workers don't work or don't work the, the hours they would like to work. You know that in the United States very well. Uh, and those who work, work at pitiful wages. So the many have little spending power. Uh, and, and, and that creates, it's what Marx referred to as a realization, the realization problem. So the factories can produce a lot more than they actually do, okay? And the, the system effectively generates permanent thirst for demand, permanent um, uh, substandard levels of demand. The way to expand that demand and expand the markets is to find vital space elsewhere for your exports. Um, even if you don't care about the resources of the developing world, you know, you, you care about their spending power. You know, people, when, when, when Greece entered the European economic community back in the 1980s, and then again when Greece, you know, pipsqueak, little Greece, the Missouri and the, uh, and the Tennessee of, uh, of Europe, or the Puerto Rico of Europe, if you want, when we, when we entered uh, the European Union, um, people were saying, you know, why do they want the Greeks there? I mean, what do they have to produce? Do you know what we had to produce? What we had to offer the European Union? Spending power. Where did we find the spending power? We weren't rich. No, it was 10 million people. But we didn't have any debt. We owned our own home. Not, you know, not, not very expensive. But nevertheless, we didn't have credit cards. We didn't have mortgages. We didn't have car loans. We didn't have student loans. So we were a, a, a German banker's wet dream. Because they had all this money to lend. They didn't have anybody to lend to. Here are the Greeks who don't have, own any, they don't owe any money. They have a home. They have collateral, we can give them money and we can provide them with a German car as well. So we sell them the car because the German factory has its, all its excess capacity. Okay? Now, that kind of tendency to create vital spaces in other countries in less developed parts of the world, when you've got different countries doing this, whether it's America and China today or England and France back in the 1920s or 1910s, that creates conflict. And the result is war. And also, yeah, remember 1991, why did the first Gulf War happen? I will give you a very um, economic um, controversial theory of mine. I could be completely wrong, but I strongly believe in it. You can shoot me down if you want. Look, 1991 was the year when the Soviet Union stopped being the Soviet Union. And when, you know, the, the, the United States, the, even the State Department and the Pentagon were, you know, they could not justify the huge expenditure on nuclear weapons when the enemy had collapsed. So, but suddenly they realized, you know, the, the, the massive economic crisis was happening. You remember 1991 because of low levels of demand and falling levels of demand. And they had to replenish the stock, the inventory. Um, you know, and so they, they fired all the Persian and all the cruise missiles. They didn't care where they fired it. They had to fire it somewhere. So they invented an enemy who used to be, you know, one of their, their buddies, their bastard to quote uh, Roosevelt, <laughs> and, you know, they unleashed the war. So it's, it's, it's clear where the connection between techno-feudalisms, uh, you know, propensity to produce dearth in demand with military affairs, or imperialism more generally. Okay. Um, let me just uh, scale this up a little bit then. I mean, the Typically, we get a question like this after every one of these presentations, and not surprising that we're getting it again today, is in, in its simplest form, what to do. Um, huh. So um, this scales it up quite a bit uh, to think about in both of your remarks. Um, you, you have provided us with, I think, uh, really uh, penetrating kinds of descriptions of the problems and the and the ways in which these uh, systems are functioning. But now the question uh, comes in inevitably from our students, what to do about all of this? Is, is there any way into this? Um, so for Lisa, there's a, a couple of um, uh, fairly specific kinds of questions about this. And one is specifically, what would it take via a change in either federal law or constitution to stop companies from being a person having an artificial legal persona 
able to fund candidate elections or their ability to refuse to comply with federal mandates due to religious grounds and so forth. And wouldn't a 90% income tax as we had in the 1950s, for example, a marginal rate uh, combined with a, a much higher income tax, uh, inheritance tax and much higher corporate taxes, would this begin to uh, resolve the issue? And then for Giannis, can we scale some of those questions up to the sort of international scale that you're describing? Thank you, Marvin, and thank you for um, those questions. I, I do. I mean, I do think that in some ways the question of personhood is a uh, one of statute. The United States Code defines a person to include human beings as well as corporations as a matter of ease for the application of U.S. Uh, federal law. But also, the Supreme Court has expanded that doctrine uh, far beyond uh, what any framer would have considered feasible, given the fact that there were so few actual corporations at the time of the founding of the United States. And the Supreme Court uh, through right-wing members uh, over time have expanded corporate rights. So much so as the question alludes to a company named Hobby Lobby could assert that it had a religious belief that trumped the rights of the women human beings who worked for it, that its religious belief would bar them from having access to intrauterine devices to IUDs to prevent you know, conception. And that that religious belief somehow superseded the human rights interests of ordinary people. Uh, as an aside, that company was then later found to have stolen thousands of artifacts from the Middle East. So apparently a non-specific religious dictate on IUDs uh, was applicable, but a specific religious dictate against stealing was not ap applicable to that you know, corporate person. Um, but uh, that would change it, but the Supreme Court remains a very serious challenge and problem. And I think the Supreme Court has to be expanded. Uh, it's, it should be expanded to meet the needs of the American people. Um, the courts overall need to be expanded. We have so many more people than we've had before, um, but that takes uh, the will of legislators to do so and the power of legislators to do so. Um, it's also the case that um, it's not just corporations. The biggest donors, the biggest uh, influencers, dark money influencers over these past 10 years have been the CEOs of corporations and the wealthy scions of um, big families that raise a lot of, you know, made a lot of money before. And so, um, regulating corporations is only part of the solution. The other part of the challenge is to really limit the power of, of money in American elections spent by anyone, human beings in particular, to have such a distorting role um, and to do so secretly so that the donors know who they're giving to, the recipients know who, the, who, who their benefactors are, but you don't. It's a, it's a um, legalized bribery system that the Supreme Court has basically authorized through its decisions. And so, um, ultimately, we need, um, you know, tremendous persistence on the American people to demand these changes. Um, otherwise, this Constitution is um, like a suicide pact, basically. We'll come back to uh, those remarks, but let me uh, make the question of, of what to do a little more specific for Janos. Um, and the question is this, how do we start to transcend techno-feudalism and move toward a different vision for organizing uh, social and political economy. Uh, and one, one uh, student asked, uh, how do we start making changes for a worker-owned economy? Your student has gone straight to the heart of the matter. Um, look, um, I believe that um, the time for gradualism and for simply doing a Green New Deal, which I'm all in support in favor of, um, but you know, to put all our eggs in that Green New Deal, gradualist kind of Green Keynesianism basket uh, is a mistake now. This is a time for radical change. So I'll answer the, the, the question directly. We need to amend corporate law. It's really very simple. Uh, one person, one share, one vote. Imagine if, you know, if the principle that applies to democracy applied to corporations, and the principle that applies to democracy is you cannot have more than one vote and you cannot buy and sell them and you cannot even short them or rent them. <laughs> and it's absurd. To imagine somebody suggesting that we should be able to, to leverage or buy or purchase or you know, rent our votes. They would say, what? Yeah, but that's what happens you know, when it comes to economic decision making. You, know, you buy votes by buying shares and you can, you can rent them in the process of shorting them. It's absurd. So uh, I think especially young people should start 
uh, considering the absurdity of it and how natural it would be to say, um, yeah, we, we, let's have markets. Let's have fully fledged markets. But, you know, in the same way that you do not buy and sell shares, you don't buy and sell library cards, university library cards, or votes, right? You get into university, it's competitive to get in, right? There is a process, interviewing process, you have to pass various, various hoops to get in. You get in, you get the library card. That library card allows you to do stuff, right? You cannot sell it, you cannot lend it. And when you stop being a student, when you leave the college, right, you give it back. So imagine shares like that. Um, you know, you, uh, the, the community of the corporation in, uh, interviews you, they hire you, you get a, a, you know, a, a company card, which is a share, and it's also a vote, and you vote on everything. And if you don't work in the company, you don't vote. It's really very simple. Now, imagine the, you know, suppose we could press a button and make this law. Not that it would be as easy as that, of course, right? Uh, but imagine just science fiction for a moment. You press the button and it happens. Capitalism goes away. You have markets. You have freedom. People can get into a company. They can get out of the company. Um, you can take your accumulated savings with you and start another company with other people, but they all have one share, one vote. Uh, and if you do that, suddenly Wall Street collapses because Wall Street is not about banking. Wall Street is about creating money out of thin air to give to rich people to wager, to play, place bets on share, on the share market. But once shares can no, no longer be bought and sold, you know, what's the point of J.P. Morgan? It, it goes away. It simply becomes, you don't even need to ban it. It dies. It just goes away. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm talking about pressing buttons and so on, because last year I spent some time, to, you know, it was therapy for me. I wrote a, a piece of political science fiction, I call it Another Now, in which I have a chapter in which I try to answer the next question that's coming from you, Mar, I'm sure, which is, okay, how do we get there? Um, and the answer must certainly be, we move away from nation state politics. Uh, the obsession of Americans, including progressive Americans, with American politics is mind-blowingly depressing. The, you know, the, the capitalists, the bankers, no internationalism. They practice it. They are, the Davos cap capitalists are internationalists. The Trumpists are internationalists. They understand the importance of, you know, working together with Modi, with Bolsonaro, with Salvini, with all the fascists in the world. Only the progressives, especially the American progressives, you know, think that they can change America by forming alliances within America. You know, Bernie Sanders is a friend of mine, you know, we've worked together, we've done things together, but I, I was stupefied by, you know, his teams and the wonderful comrades, you know, who do not see beyond the borders of the United States. Unless we internationalize the movement for transcending te techno, techno feudalism, it's the Bidens and Trumps that will rule the, the roost. So, uh, quite clearly, uh, the next step for uh, techno feudalism is to start producing and selling the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's, that's right next on the agenda, I would say. Um, so um, let's, let's make it practical. We don't have the button yet. It's not been niche marketed to us. Um, what, what are the immediate sort of steps that either of you would start to recommend? I know that Lisa, you, you concluded with a, a sort of hopeful message that is not wait, let, let's work on this. But what should people now be thinking about uh, trying to do in their own capacity. And we've talked about this ourselves in the, in the class any number of times. That is, we're up against a, a hegemonic common sense uh, that, that not only uh, attempts to describe the world in the way that it is, but advocates constantly and remorselessly for this is the way the world ought to be. And so many people uh, simply take that for granted. And so we're up against that kind of a uh, a prevailing worldview. How do we begin to shake people out of that? I mean, we think about sort of the material conditions as producing a kind of consciousness, but that, that gets completely distracted and distorted for people through the sort of conglomerated media and so forth. So how do, how do we begin, or how would you in your own work, both of you, really begin to break through those kind of um, almost insurmountable barriers? I was gonna, I wanna start by taking Yanis's point about the fact that these are 
these are global problems and they require global solutions. They require alliances abroad and not just this inward focus, even though I confess my, my uh, talk with you today was focused on the work I've been doing you know, within the United States. The fact is, is that we can't solve climate change alone. We have to do it together. We clearly can't uh, handle the uh, globalization, the globalized world that we live in in terms of public health. We have to redress public health and have a better systems, better processes together, uh, or we're doomed. We have to redress these uh, transnational corporations and this transnational corporate dominance uh, of, of these modern democracies. We, ha we have to you know, look to each other to do that. But also I think that um, you know, there are things on the, on the small scale or the low, not small scale, but like the local scale, like you know, are you, who are you electing to your county board? Um, county boards almost set aside the votes of whole cities. Uh, in this past election uh, fight. Uh, who are you, uh, what are you pushing for in terms of the local policies? You know, there should be uh, taxation on this wealth. Why can't a city tax this wealth? We could have a tiny tax on every Amazon transaction uh, or not even a tiny tax, a massive tax. You know, but there's been a resistance to having um, those policies. Uh, Alec and, and Coke and the telecom companies have resisted local broadband that would get broadband to everyone without having to pay them for our, you know, the use of our airwaves, the public's airwaves. I, I think um, to, to uh, go to uh, Giannis's other point, which is imagine, imagine that, that we can do things differently. You know, uh, they invented antitrust law more than hundred years ago to deal with the trusts. What is the new things that need to be invented to contain, uh, to contain these companies or to uh, pursue some sort of, um, you know, you can't sell votes, no, you know, a policy that Giannis talked about. Um, you know, what are, the what are the things that we can choose differently and start pushing for them with our friends, with our family, uh, locally in our democracy, um, and, I, and I know that my time is almost up on, on, the, on the piece of roll, but I wanted to say um, another part of that is just the philosophy of enough. There was a passage um, where Kurt Vonnegut was telling Joseph Heller that some hedge fund man manager made more uh, in a day than Joseph Heller made in all the sales of all the books of Catch-22, his famous book. And Heller responded to Vonnegut, but I have something he'll never have, which is enough, enough. And this idea that these corporations and these CEOs are entitled to endless wealth at our expense and without constraint, we have got to resist that and destroy that idea as so immoral and so contrary to humanity and to the needs of the 21st century, we have got to counter it in every way we, we you know, lawfully can. So let me turn it back to Giannis for his, uh, his reply. And, um, we're almost out of time, but if you, if the two of you are willing, there are a lot of people still on the call, so maybe we'll go over just a few minutes, if that's okay. okay. All right, uh, so uh, Mark, let me add to my previous question and give an example also that uh, Lisa may mention. Uh, so what do we do? We're already doing it to a large extent, but we need a lot more of you to join us. Um, yeah. Noam and I are on the council of something we call the Progressive International, which uh, Bernie and I launched uh, in Vermont in 2018. Uh, you know, we have uh, council members from all over the world, and we're in the process of doing two things. Firstly, an international agenda, a Green New Deal agenda, a global one, and secondly, global campaigns. And this is where Lisa's example comes in. Amazon. All right, to tackle Amazon, there's nothing you can do in your hometown, in your state, even within the United States. It's, it's a global phenomenon. But, you know, we started a campaign. Um, we managed to mobilize 200 million workers uh, on Black Friday uh, around the world. We had uh, a rolling strike. It started in Bangladesh, in Amazon warehouses in Bangladesh, spread over to Germany and ended up in New Jersey. Uh, and, and, and this was just that, you know, it, it, it was a warm up. Imagine if the next time we do it and we shall do it, we organize not just workers, but a consumer boycott on the basis, not, not a general consumer boycott, one day. You know, we fix one day and we say around the world, just don't visit Amazon.com for one day to send them a message. Okay. And for them to know that this is only the beginning. 
and to, for the governments to know that unless we do what Lisa said, you know, minimum work standards, accept unionization, um, a 4%, not a huge uh, tax, 4% tax, which they are resisting tooth and nail because they have Cayman Islands and they have the, you know, this archipelago of tax havens so that they don't pay any, anything. You know, so the beauty of this is that it is internationalist. It happens in Bangladesh and in New Jersey simultaneously, and it is local. It is local because it's in support of the little Chris Smalls around the world. Uh, so this is what we need to do and build up the agenda. Agree amongst ourselves what are, you know, the, the button. How do we make this button happen? And what precise button do we want? You know, I don't want to be the one that pontificates and tells young people in Nigeria which button we should press. But let's agree what those buttons are and then set out internationalist campaigns in order to, you know, to push them. Okay. I want to just give the uh, last couple of minutes to you guys to um, think about uh, a sort of hopeful um, uh, outcome. And it's going to start in a, in a little bit of a peculiar way. And the, several questions have come in about this. We're, we're clearly facing um, a, a, global a global catastrophe at the moment. Ma many of them uh, are off, not in the future at all, but are here, like climate change is not off in the future. People are, in fact, in, in, in deep trouble in many places around the world right now, not off in 2030, 2040, 2050. But we're also at the moment facing uh, a global pandemic, COVID, and with others to come. So this is what's a little bit strange about the question for uh, opening up something hopeful. COVID, with all of its horrors, has demonstrated certain kind of capacities that we didn't know that we had or have forgotten that we had. And so I'm interested in both of you thinking a little bit about the ways in which COVID has opened up not just horrors, but opportunities. That is, we've, we've seen very rapid movement by governments um, in, at, at various scales. We've seen uh, people's ability to change behaviors in many cases on a dime, um, although there's resistance to that. But I think if we look closely at the, at the pandemic and our, our responses to it, there are also these glimmers of things that we didn't really think we could imagine before it. Um, that is, very few of us have, have absolute memories of the uh, earlier uh, influenza uh, pandemic. But what we have now uh, with us is, as I say, opening up different imaginaries for people if we can mobilize them and narrate them in the proper ways. So I'm, I'm going to just leave it to each of you to think a little bit about whether COVID uh, itself has produced for us certain kinds of viewpoints that we just really might not have had before it. Wow, it is, it's such a profound question because it is um, such a tragedy, uh, certainly what's happened in the United States and, and around the world, but in terms of the failure, the failures here that have been um, so deadly. Um, I, I, think, I do think that there, there are lessons that can come out of this um, and, and things that can, that can and will transform uh, societies around the world, and and one of them is um, uh, is the question of, of where work happens for many people, not for everybody, but for many people, um, which also affects um, families, uh, you know, and how families are 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 constituted. It's also the case that it, I think it has opened up uh, questions, uh, certainly in the U.S. and and I'm sure around the world about um, you know what is the purpose of education. Uh, you know, educating children. Uh, you know, it, it's clear that part of that is is uh, is watching children while people work, um, not just uh, educating children, right? And so there's been this tremendous um, uh, set of conversations, and there's been this tremendous inequity in terms of how families have have been able to respond to this crisis in terms of tutors or tech technology or what have you. So I think that what what I hope what I hope will happen, I guess I should say, um, and, and I've been working, I should say, I've, all, I've also been working with a group called boldrethink.org, which just launched to try to think about how we can boldly rethink these things it's in light of the pandemic. It was being created at the time of the pandemic, but like, what are all the systems that must be changed because they failed? 
in this situation? How can we change the education system in the United States, the public education system to be more equitable, to be, to be better system? How can we address the, the needs of families um, uh, and children in, in working? Um, what can we do to, in the healthcare systems to uh, better respond to um, uh, the, the way our systems have been isolated in the US and other places in terms of um, uh, elder care and the profit margins that have been so distorting and destructive in that in those nur skilled nursing facilities. There's just a, it's just a whole array of things that this circumstance, I think, calls into question for reform. And also just the idea of money and markets and how what this what this what Wall Street is and what it actually isn't in terms of our real economy. Um, so I just think I think that I think that it's a, a, a moment for really questioning almost everything, questioning those assumptions and, and devising new institutions, new systems. Um, and that also goes for climate change. This question that you couldn't possibly address climate change because people wouldn't act. We are in a catastrophe and it's unfolding on a daily basis. And um, we have the capacity to act. And I think that despite the resistance and this sort of anti-science um, a uh, selfish strain that has emerged in the US and other countries in response to the pandemic. Most people get it. Most people believe in science. Most people know we're in a hell of a crisis. Most people think we need to do better. And so um, we need to make that into action. So it's a this crisis opens, um, as terrible as it is, opens up the opportunity to envision things and change things dramatically or radically, as Jana says, like we need not gradualism, we need bold, serious, substantial changes. So Janos, I'll turn it back to you for the final comment. I think you put it very well in your introduction, Marv, because it is true that even we of the left uh, had been lulled into this false sense of believing that um, our political sphere, our governments, had become defunct because of financialization, globalization, and so on. We underestimated the capacity of the state. And uh, you know, COVID-19 reminded us you know, they can do anything. They can, you know, effectively create a curfew and shut us into our, into our homes for a year. <laughs> you know, uh, beyond that, um, I think that co we owe COVID-19 a great favor because it has killed off this rubbish coming from neoliberals about the money tree. You know, every time we support, we, we, we proposed, you know, a little bit of assistance to the elderly, to, 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 to the young, to this, to uh, oh, You just invented the money tree, mate, have you? Well, the money tree is alive and, you know, boisterous. It is producing huge quantities of money. And, you know, those who were admonishing us for believing in the, ma in the magical money tree uh, are harvesting it uh, and, and, and the, as if there's no tomorrow. So, you know, that, that, that I think is a major turning point regarding the, the narrative. Um, you know, bankruptcy. Remember the neoliberal story that bankruptcy is to capitalism, that which hell is to Christianity. In other words, it's a terrible thing, but it is necessary. The system doesn't work without it. Well, you know, they, they, they suspended all bankruptcies. You know, there are no bankruptcies. And for the last year, capitalism has fallen into a hole, but there are no bankruptcies. Why? Because the state is there, the money tree is functioning, you know. So, so we need to harness that. They harness it on behalf of the oligarchy. We now need to harness it on behalf of the many. Um, you know, the myth that wealth is the result, is a, you know, is, is, is a, a fair return on capital, on entrepreneurship, on parsimony, on hard work. You know, that capitalists thrive, to, to thrive, capitalists need a thriving capitalism. Rubbish. Capitalism is in a deep hole and capitalists are doing really very well. And, <laughs> and they are getting rich at a rate that no entrepreneurship, no parsimony, and no hard work can ever, ever explain. I mean, I, look, Jeff Bezos is a clever man. He's clever, let's say, than I am. Um, and he's certainly a better entrepreneur than I am, right? Um, and a lot of his wealth is due to his smartness. A lot of it, you know, quite a few billion, but not all the billion that he has. And especially not the, all the billion that he amassed during, during the pandemic, right? That is not the result of returns to capital. You know, <laughs> you, you just say these things today, even to the most neoliberal thinker, and they, 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 they look discomforted because they know you're right. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, we, we have all these uh, uh, narrative 
boosts and changes to thank COVID-19 for. And I think the, the final one that I'm going to leave you with, you know, um, the idea that radical change is uh, irresponsible, out. Now, even Biden is saying that, you know, the, the danger is, is, doing, is being too moderate. Uh, not that he means it, but nevertheless, even he has been forced to say it. So, you know, radical change, uh, but what kind of radical change and how do we ensure that it is in the interest of the many? Thanks. I think that's a very good place to end it for today. And I want to thank both of you for just tremendous conversation. And um, there are a lot of questions that we did not get to, um, but I'm going to encourage people uh, to be in touch with you directly uh, for follow up for this. But uh, really appreciate both of you being here. Um, and thank you very much for uh, participating today. Thank you. It's been great fun. Thank you, Lisa. Nice to meet you. Nice to Hope you. to meet you in person. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Well, and the rest of you. Both of you are essential workers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much.